All right, grab your Bibles. Find the book of Genesis, if you can. It's right in the beginning. Don't forget uh, baptisms after this service. If you've never been baptized, or maybe you were baptized as an infant and you want to make that public uh, as a rational thinking person that you want to follow Jesus, today's the day. We're going through this series, Make Us One, and today we're going to look at one designer, and that is God, and he has designed life for human flourishing. And we're going to bounce around a few scriptures, mostly in Genesis 2, 2 and 3, and look at a couple of big ideas. But Lord, we do just pray right now that you would speak to us as an act of worship, God, we open our hearts, not... Uh, to our own feelings, God, but to your word. And we give your word authority over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, considering something, what something is designed for, is a very smart thing to do. I mean, we wouldn't go uh, taking off driving on sand in a Mercedes C-Class, right? We'd get a Jeep. We wouldn't want to set out to play rock and roll music with a classical guitar. It's not designed for that. Right? And I think a lot of times people approach life that way. They try to do life being their own designer and ignoring the things that God has designed us for and the way that he has designed us. So three big ideas I want to point out. Normally we go verse by verse, but I feel strongly we're supposed to take a few weeks and do this. But the first big idea is that God designed humanity, that is male and female. So we're going to look at three big ideas, and all three of these are before what the Bible calls the fall of man. If you're new to church, maybe that doesn't uh, make much sense. The fall of man is something that happened in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve sinned against God, brought sin into the world, God cursed the world that we live in, and you and I currently live in a cursed world. We suffer the consequences of sin, but that doesn't mean that God has not designed us, male and female, that he has designed work, and he has also designed family. And we're going to look at the good things that God has designed us for, and even though we deal with the consequences of sin, I think God wants us to Consider these things and let it strengthen us this morning. So first thing, God designed humanity, and let's look at the creation of man. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 5. It says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust. And from the ground he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So the first thing that God has designed is man. And it's very different. It's actually different than the creation of woman. If you notice there, in verse 7, what does it say? It says, the Lord God formed the man of what? What does it say? Dust. So it's appropriate that men are dirtbags, right? (laughs) It's one thing you could say. That's one thing that's different between men and women is men were created from dirt, dust, women, on the other hand, were created out of man. It actually doesn't say that women were created from dust, which is very interesting. He designed both. God created both. And both are made in what we would call the image of God. That's actually mentioned back in chapter 1. I believe it's on the screen also. Notice both male and female were created in the image of God. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female he created him. Now, we don't have to go, time to go into all of what that means, but we are distinctly different 
from animals. We have not just evolved over a millions and billions of years and through survival of the fittest. No, God has created human beings as the prize of his possession, of his creation. It's pretty fascinating to think, actually, when you, know, you look at the, the first couple of verses of the Bible, God says, let there be light, and let there be the heavens and the earth. God said, you know, he created the heavens and the earth. Of all the complicated stars and the sun, moon, and the stars, he gives just a few little words, right? But the entire Bible is about God's relationship to man and man's relationship to God. We, as human beings, are distinct from animals. God gave us animals. He gave us animals for barbecue. It was one of the reasons he gave us animals. I'm not making a joke. I mean, Pete, Jesus said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. We're not animals. And if you have the world view that we are just animals, I mean, there's no place for the kind of love that God desires, right? But God designed man in his image distinctly different than animals, but also man and woman different. Notice, let's look at the creation of woman in verse 18 of Genesis 2. The Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So this is a good thing that God's doing, creating woman. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call them. Verse 20, the man gave names uh, to all the livestock, the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed it up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Tragically, many chauvinist men over the years have abused this verse and said, oh, you're just a helper, right, and look down on women. But God has created men and women equal as people, equal in his sight. But together they complement. They are distinctly different, but both together are to image God. But men and women are distinctly different. The word Azer, or Azer, I believe is how it's pronounced, is the, he- the Hebrew word uh, translated for helper. Very interesting. As I was studying for this, uh, Deborah, who, who leads our Women in the Word, she sent over her notes uh, for her teaching that's coming up. She was just going to check, hey, is this okay? But very interesting. She, the whole thing was about this word. Azer is the word for helper. She said some very interesting things, and I wanted to point out some of the things from her notes that she had said about this word Azer used in the Bible. Notice most of the time this word Azer, translated helper here, is used in the Bible in describing Yahweh. And there's several references to it. That's not all of them by any means. And going on here, she says, Scriptures like, The Lord is my helper, or the Lord is an ever present help. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord or from God. It reminds us that the Lord, Yahweh, is our azer. Very interesting, isn't it? She goes on to say, keeping the home is important, rearing children is important, being an ally to husbands is important, but our roles does not end there, as we will see by looking at the lives of the women uh, azers in the Bible. And then I like what she says here, an azer is an ally or rescuer, someone who comes running when people cry for help. An azer drops everything to save those in need, a hero. You know, it's not something that is beneath men. A lady is not a beneath a man. Together, they complement one another, but they are distinctly different, different genders, two different genders. You know, you think of the eye, for example. Uh, Jazz, one of the elders, he, he's since moved away. He used to talk about, you know, it's a good comparison in some ways. The eye is something 
It's designed for human flourishing. Imagine doing life without our eye, right? It's so, uh, in, in itself, it's, it's just a evidence of God, how amazing it is, how it can see, and all the focus. But we protect our eye. It's delicate, highly complicated. <laughs> nobody got, no, I mean, nobody got, like a lady, right? No, no I'm just kidding. Crickets. I thought it was funny, a little bit. But you think about it, it's a good illustration, but it's, you think of it t- together, they complement. It only can be taken so far, but men and women are equally human, both created in the image of God. Neither one is inferior to the other. I uh, took this from my past, old pastor Danny, uh, his message, and I thought this was pretty funny. He pointed out that there's many differences between men and women, and he said four women and four men were asked to give reasons why a computer should be referred to as either male or female. The females said the computer should be referred to as masculine for the following four reasons. Number one, in order to get their attention, you have to turn them on. Secondly, they have a lot of data but are still clueless. This is a female saying computers should be considered masculine for these reasons. Two more, he says, they're supposed to help solve problems, but half the time they are the problem. And then they said, uh, female said masculine, because as soon as you commit to one, you realize that if you had waited just a little longer, you could have had a better model. <clears throat> Males said that computers should be feminine for the following four reasons. No one but their creator understands their internal logic. Secondly, the native language they use to communicate with other computers is incomprehensible to everyone else. Even your smallest mistakes are stored in long-term memory for later retrieval. And fourthly, males said feminines because as soon as you commit to one, you find yourself spending half your paycheck on accessories for it. Not in my experience, but I'm just telling you, somebody else said this. I don't <clears throat> the men and women are uniquely different, biologically different. Women have two X chromosomes, men have an X and a Y chromosome. On average, women have four-fifths of a gallon of blood in their body, while men have more blood. They have at least, on average, a gallon and a half. For women, on average, 20% of body weight is muscle. For men, 40%. God made men to be warriors, protectors. They're out to conquer. God made us to lay down our lives for others. I mean, think of the common thing. I mean, it used to be common. If everybody's on a ship and the ship is sinking, the women and the children get on the lifeboat. We men, we die, right? That's how, that's the difference. We die, right? That's where God's made us that way, right? The whole reproductive system is different. The female body is fascinating when you think about it. The way they can conceive a child in their uterus, grow a child for nine months inside of their body, give birth to a child out of their body, (laughs) feed a child for, I mean, a year with their body. There are major biological differences between male and male and female, man and woman. Thank the Lord. Women are more feeling-oriented, nurturing, relational. They're naturally empathetic, much more sensitive to the needs of children. That is God's design for humanity. It's God's design for human flourishing in a city, in a country, in a nation, in a world. I love what Elizabeth Elliot said about the differences between male and female. She said, In what sense is red equal to blue? They are equal only in the sense that both are colors on the spectrum. Apart from that, they are different, right? God designed human beings, male and female, before the fall, and it's good. And together, they complement one another. And together, that's the way God designed it for human flourishing, to be fruitful and multiply, right? We have one designer. We're not our own designer. A second big idea here, first, God designed humanity, but secondly, 
God designed work. Before the fall, before work is not a punishment, work is good. It is satisfying. Notice several scriptures here. You know, we just read Genesis 2, 5, verse 5. This is when, um, the, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain, and there was no man to work the ground. He's like, there's a problem here. There's no man to work this garden. He says it again in verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. He says it again in verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. The garden and man are inseparable. The two go together. God has designed men to work. God has designed all of us, in a sense, to be productive. Doesn't mean women can't work or something like that. He's designed us all to be productive, to produce. And we all know the satisfaction of that, whether it's, I mean, something like we produce a song or we work hard at, at work and it's, it's satisfying to, I mean, cleaning something is satisfying. We know that. I mean, of course, we know the frustrations of work. Because of the fall, we deal with the frustrations, right? But there is a divine connection. God has made us to work. If you're an able-bodied person, He's made you, He's designed you to be a producer. From working your profession, to building your home, to running a business, or working in the social sector, you're a human being created in God's image and is designed for human, pe- human uh, flourishing is that good people like you produce, right? That you work hard in our schools and our families and businesses and the public sector, whatever it is. You know, even Solomon mentioned this. He he said, you know, it's a gift of God that you enjoy your work. In many ways, work is enjoyable. But on the other hand, right there with the enjoyment of work is the busted knuckles, right? the dissatisfied customer or, you know, loss of life. But these things are the result of the fall of man. Something's not right. Something's out of sync. But we would all, if we're able-bodied people, God has called us to work, right? Notice several, several New Testament scriptures on this, right? Look at 2 Thessalonians 3, for example. It's on the screen. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And this was an issue in the the early church. I mean, they had no welfare system, so there were people that were not able or uh, able to work, and the church was rightly able to care for them. Widows, fatherless children, right? The disabled. But if anyone can work, they should work. And and notice it says, now, uh, some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. There was no government to depend on back then, right? Here's another scripture on work. It's a, it's a basic idea. And it's not just for money, right? But we work, look at this, whatever you do, work heartily. Not complaining because it's hard, right? But work heartily. As for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive Uh, the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. There's a greater purpose to our work in the city, right? It's not just for money and a paycheck. It's for the Lord, but yes, we do produce. We're not dependent. Notice one more scripture here, 1 Thessalonians 4. Aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Christian people work hard and they are not just dependent on the government to, to provide, right? Work is not a punishment. Work is good. Work is God's design. God is, God is a creative, working God. And those of us created in His image, we have that within us also. We have a garden. It's raising kids. It's building a family. It's building the kingdom, right? We have a garden to work. A third big idea for us this morning is 
So first of all, we have God designed humanity, God designed work, and God designed family. God's design for human flourishing within a city, within a nation, within the world, is family. This is before the fall. Man and woman getting married, being fruitful, and multiplying. Verse 28 of Genesis 1, it says, And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Right? Genesis 2.24, this is the first wedding in a sense. Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the first wedding. This is the first family. God created family as a good thing for the purpose of multiplying, being fruitful and multiplying. Sex is not just for pleasure, right? Sex is to procreate. Man and woman. Before the fall, God made families. God created the two to work together, to fit together, to form a family. What a beautiful thing God has created, male and female. Two people, male and male, is not God's design. Female and female is not God's design. And it's not just because he's mean. It's not just because he doesn't want to, you know, maybe you are, struggle with same-sex attraction. First of all, God's design pictured in Scripture is God being masculine, his people being feminine. In that sense, just the Christ in the church. Christ is the groom. The church is the bride. It's a picture of Christ in the church, male and female, the marriage. In the Old Testament, same thing. You have God, the Most High God, pictured as masculine, male, with Israel, the bride. So when we take and we try and join male with male, in the first sense, we are discarding his design for him and his people. And it's the theme all throughout the scriptures. Also, it's not God's design for human flourishing, right? It's not science. It's, biology says you cannot procreate, you cannot be fruitful and multiply. But listen, I realize same-sex attraction is very common in our culture. I'm not min minimizing anyone's feelings, and I'm trying to keep this PG. I ran into a, I uh, went to a lecture. I was at the Evangelical Theological Society this past year with Jack, and there was a lady there by the name of Rachel Gilson. She was giving a lecture. I really appreciated her testimony and her lecture. She was talking about uh, this very thing, homosexuality, same-sex attraction. And she pointed out that same idea. But what, what's interesting was her testimony. She grew up an atheist um, in same-sex relationships. Uh, she was saved her freshman year in Yale and broke off that relationship, went a long time without dating anyone, and eventually did get married to a male, a man. And she now has one child. You know, one of the things that she said in relation to her decision to uh, fight that desire within herself was, she said, she asked herself the question, who owns me? Is it my desires or my Lord? And in her case, she's now married, right? Like I said. You know, I know that's not the same for everyone. I have several guy friends over the years who had same-sex attraction. There was a guy, a close friend of mine, who was on our board for the church for a long time, who was same-sex attracted. He remained celibate his whole life. This guy, Trace, who uh, has since gone home to be with the Lord, one of the things that he used to say was, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality, it's holiness. And I always loved that about him. He also remained singles after coming to Christ. There's nothing that is a good thing. Celibacy is a good thing. If you're single, you can be fully devoted to the Lord. Jesus never got married. It's a good thing to, to stay single, stay fully devoted to the Lord. 
But the reality is that we all have desires that are contrary to God's design, and we are to have self-control. God's design for humanity and for the flourishing of the world and His creation is that male and female get married in holy matrimony, have sex within holy matrimony, right? And raise a family to the glory of God. That's God's design. You know, all of these things are, in a sense, in our experience with all of these things, they are tainted by the fall. They are tainted by sin. Our human life, for example, as a male, as a woman, as a, as a child of God created in His image, we all have the sinful nature in us now. In Adam, all die. Sin was handed down to every one of us. Our work is affected by sin. Our families are affected by sin. And I want to read, and we have plenty of time here. Turn over with me to Genesis 3. This is what is known as the fall of man. You need to know this. If you're new to the faith, you need to understand this idea. God designed these things good. Then you have the fall of man and what is known as God's curse. He cursed animals. He cursed the world. And it's affected us as individuals. It affects our work. And it affects our families. Let's read together Genesis 3, picking it up in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He gets her to, um, to think that God's word is a lie, right? Did he really say that? To doubt God's word. And verse 2, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent lied to the woman, said to the woman, you will not surely die. A blatant lie. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So she was tempted and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the eyes, right? She saw it, and it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, the flesh, right? She took of it, of the fruit, and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, saying nothing, apparently, and he ate it. So she as the helper, as the azer, is not fulfilling her role to help the husband glorify God, and Adam himself is not leading the family. He's just keeping his mouth shut, watching his wife fall into sin. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths, which cannot be comfortable, by the way. Verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Isn't that amazing? God used to walk with them in the garden. And the man and his wife hid themselves. That's what sin does. It separates from God. They hide themselves. They're feeling shame, ashamed. And they hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? It's not like he didn't know, right? He's just introspected, this question. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And we're still lost in our sin and we've never been forgiven through Jesus Christ. That's what we do. We don't want anything of God. We hide from God. Verse 11, and he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Then he blames his wife. Verse 12. The man said, The woman you gave me. He blames his wife. The woman you gave me, gave, uh, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. Adam blames the wife. The wife blames Satan. No, it wasn't me. Blame game. There's no one to blame but themselves, right? When we sin. The woman said the serpent, but then the Lord God here, he cursed 
And this is the fall. This is the curse. This is what we deal with. Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That is a picture of the gospel, but then goes on and he says this. To the woman he said, I'll surely multiply your pain in childbearing. So now God's design is still be fruitful and multiply, but there's pain involved. In pain you shall bear children. There's also frustration in relationships. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. There's struggles in marriage now because of sin. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Work is painful. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field by the sweat of your face, and you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of these things that God created good have been affected by sin. And you and I, we live in that world, and that is God's design, and creation itself was subjected to futility. And part of the message is this morning, don't be discouraged as you fulfill God's design. We wrestle with sin now, but we're longing for heaven. One day, all things will be redeemed, right? But it's commendable. It's commendable. Father, as you continue to work hard and struggle with work to provide, it's commendable. Ladies, as you struggle with the pains of childbirth and you all work together to raise a family. Individuals, on an individual that we all are fighting the sinful nature that's within ourselves, but God has called us to fulfill and to live under His design. We are not the designer. He is the designer. What the world is doing, they're suppressing the truth. And they worship created things. That's the temptation. The temptation is, you are created in the image of God, so now you're going to live like a God. Right? That's the temptation. You have these creative abilities given to you by God to glorify Him, so you use them not for the glory of God, but for your own glory. Same with work. The temptation is to suppress the truth, to, to worship created things instead of the Creator, and to use your work for greed and materialism. To only just store away things for your own self and for your own glory. Same with sex, right? The temptation is not to use it within holy matrimony, but to pervert it into hedonism, right? To live for pleasure. That's not God's design. It's all empty. The temptation is just to suppress the truth. But what God has revealed to us, it's plain to us. We all have struggled with sin, right? We all struggle with sin. We have all have this shame where we hide ourselves. And the beautiful reality is that God's design, notice one more verse for today. Notice in verse 21 of Genesis 3, it says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. You know what that represents for us? It represents the gospel, right? God killed an animal to cover their shame. Jesus is the perfect lamb that was sacrificed for us. He was killed for you to cover your shame. Now you can live a life that glorifies God, created in His image. He's created you to image Him, and you're able to do that as you're clothed with Christ and you live with the power of the Holy Spirit. You're able to work to the glory of God because of what Christ has done for you you're in communion with God now again it's restored through the gospel you're able to have a family to the glory of God 
Not everybody is called. Some people are called, again, to be single. There's no shame in that. But God has called many people to live within holy matrimony, to work hard at family. It's not easy. But Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. He paid the price for our sins. And if you're still living in shame, maybe you're living your life and you are still living, uh, you're a narcissist, materialist, you know, and hedonist. That's your life. It's because you're still dead in sin. You're trying to, do, you take what God has created and you worship it. That's what you're living for. There's a better life. And it's in communion with God, walking with God through faith in Jesus Christ. You have a sinful nature inside of you. But Jesus died to pay the price for that. You know, this in honor of Tim Keller. Tim Keller passed away this week. And one of the things, he said so many beautiful things, but obviously, but one of the things he said is, the gospel says that you are more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe, but more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope. That is what Christ has done for you. He has restored this relationship with God. If you're a believer in Jesus and you've trusted Him, you can live to the glory of God. You can walk with Him. Maybe you've never committed your life to Christ. Today is the day, right? Be baptized. We're having baptisms today. Make it public. Trust Him. Begin to walk with Him. Place your faith in Jesus and be born again. Let's all bow in prayer this morning. God, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you, God, that we don't have to be confused about life, about your design for human flourishing. God, help us to image you as individuals in our work and in our families. Strengthen us to live for your glory, God. It's not easy. We have sin inside of us. And we live in a cursed world, working by the sweat of our brow, God. Strengthen us for your glory. We long for that day when it will all be redeemed and made right. But until then, we walk in communion with you because of the blood of Christ. Thank you so much, Lord, for this hope. Thank you for your word to us. Go before us this week, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace and joy as you walk with him this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed.